قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فلذلك فادعوا واستقم كما أمرت ولا تتبع أهواءهم وقل آمنت بما أنزل الله من كتاب وأمرت لأعدل بينكم الله ربنا وربكم لنا أعمالنا ولكم أعمالكم لا حجة بيننا وبينكم الله يجمع بيننا وإليه المصير رب شح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله اللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين What I meant to do last week was to conclude my series of khutb on these ayat of Surah Al-Shura, which were 13, 14, and 15. I didn't get to complete uh, the conversation I wanted to have with you about ayah number 15, so I hope to do that today, inshallah. Last week, I spoke with you about what Allah Azza wa Jal gave the Prophet Sallallahu as a mandate. What should he do? Uh, and how, how should he stand tall by his message? We're going to take that conversation further. The other steps the Prophet ﷺ was given, despite the opposition that he has to face, we're going to go through all of those steps today. <coughs> so we left off at, وَأُمِرْتُ لِأَعْدِلَ بَيْنَكُمْ I have been commanded to be fair between all of you, to do justice between all of you. So the Prophet ﷺ here is taking the role of a judge. And a judge seems to have some level of authority, right? Because if someone's going to do justice between me and somebody else who has a dispute with me, then uh, the, only t the only way I can get justice is I have someone mediate or, or, or look at the situation and then make a verdict, someone who has authority both over myself and over the other, right? So in these words, the Prophet ﷺ seems to have been given this authority. However, this is in Mecca. And in Mecca, Rasulullah ﷺ does not have the authority of a governor like he has in Medina, right? So once he migrates to Medina, there is a position of authority. So what we learn from that is that there are two dimensions of doing justice. There is justice that is done by a qadi, a judge, right, an authority. And that kind of justice is that not only do they decide what is fair, you get this much, you get this much, you're at fault, you're not at fault, or this much is your fault, that much is your fault. Not only do they decide that, but then they, they implement the payout, they implement the punishment, they implement the consequences, they have the authority to do that too. Right, So we think of justice not only as someone who made a judgment, but actually once they made that judgment, they have the power to execute that judgment too. So you, once you separate those two, you understand that when the Rasul ﷺ was in Medina, he had the power not only to make judgments and decide what is fair and not fair, but based on his decision, it was also implemented. But while he's in Mecca, he can only do one part of that justice. What's that part of justice? He can declare, he can speak out about what is fair and not fair. And that much he has to do. Like he can speak what, what, what is fair and what isn't fair. But he doesn't yet have the authority, the power over people to implement what is fair and isn't fair. You understand? But even then, the word used was to do justice. This is important because many times you and I find ourselves in situations, whether it's in our family life, personal life, work life, as a citizen of a government, whatever. In any of those situations, you might find yourself, you know, feeling, being powerless to implement justice. You're not, you don't have the power to do it. But that doesn't mean that you can't declare it. And you, it doesn't mean you can't call out wrong for wrong and right for right. That's actually a command he has been given. You see, the people in positions of power were the Quraysh. And Rasul Sallallahu essentially is powerless at this point from a political point of view. He doesn't have any, none of the chips are in his hand. None of the control is in his hand. And yet Allah has commanded him, a higher authority has commanded him to call out fairness and unfairness openly. right? And that actually puts him in a very difficult position. The first thing that happens to someone who doesn't have power and then speaks about what is right, right and what is wrong is, who are you to tell me? Who do you think you are? You're going, to tell, you're going to talk about what's fair and unfair? On what authority? And what is the answer to that question? On what authority? It's in the ayah itself. I have been commanded to do justice between you. Meaning he's not doing it on, on his own authority. It's because he himself has been told by Allah to do so. It's not even my choice. I have to do it. And if we understand that, then we understand that in any situation you find yourself in life, to call out what is fair as fair or unfair as unfair and to, to not let somebody be oppressed while you sit quietly and watch, you have to speak up and say something because you and I are followers of our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa who was commanded to do so. He didn't have a choice. 
So we don't have a choice to sit silent. So what happens, let me give you a real life situation. Sometimes what happens is somebody in a family is unfair. Your uncle is unfair, right? Or your brother is unfair, right? And you're, you know that they're being unfair to someone else. Not, you're not the victim, somebody else is. And you just say, just listen to your brother. It's okay. Just listen to him. Well, you, you, you want un injustice to carry on. Let them get more and more away with the injustice that they're doing. You don't want to say anything because you don't want to get in trouble yourself. Or you want somebody else to get used to injustice. You want somebody get, to get used to unfairness, right? That is not your choice to make. You and I, as slaves of Allah, have been commanded to do something. We've been commanded to stand up for what's right. And that's what's, what's being illustrated by the Prophet's own words here, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so there's two dimensions of that. One, we are commanded by Allah. Two, this is a show of loyalty for a Muslim to his messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's almost as if you put yourself in those shoes and say, if Rasulullah found me in this situation, what would he expect from me? And my love of him, my loyalty to him, وسلم, compels me to act in a certain way. A lot of times people give this example, like when, it, when somebody's misbehaving, and they'd say, what would your father say if he saw you like this? What would your mother say if she saw you like this, right? So they, they invoke the father and the mother because these are people you respect, the people that, lo that love you, that care for you. What the ayat like these do is they invoke our attachment to Rasulullah sallallahu What would your messenger say if you saw if he saw you silent on this, or if he saw you taking the wrong side? This is umir tuli ahdila baynakum. And so beyond that, he says, Allahu rabbuna wa rabbukum. And this is again timeless values. He says, Allah is our rabb and your rabb. So the, this seems a pretty basic thing to say, right? Allah is our master. Allah is your master. Allah is our caretaker, Allah is your caretaker. Allah is the ultimate authority over us, and Allah is the ultimate authority over you. It seems pretty basic. But it's teaching us something pretty heavy in the context of these ayat. And what is that? When two people have a disagreement with each other, then they both forget that even though you want something from A, a wants something from B, B wants something from A, they have the conflict with each other. But actually, before they think about what, what, before I think about what I want from you, or you think about what you want from me, I first have to think, what does my Rabb want from me? Like, I'm not free to just fight with you, or you're not just free to fight with me. There are some restraints on me and on you, and those restraints come from our Rabb. I'm answerable to him first. So even when I'm seeking justice, even when I'm calling for justice, the way in which I seek it, the things that I demand, the things that I say, they have to surrender first to my Rabb. I have to check with the higher authority first and then say something. Again, let's, let's put this in as simple example as possible so you, this makes sense to you. I don't wanna speak philosophically. I want you to understand what this is saying in everyday, in everyday sense. You know, sometimes you have an argument with your coworker. Or you're joking around about something or you're, you're disagreeing about something, right? And the conversation is getting a little bit escalated. Right? Voices are being raised and the sarcasm is turning into insults or whatever else. And the manager walks in. Who's an authority over you and your coworker? He walks in. Both of you calm down for a minute. What just happened? You guys were having an argument, but when you recognize the higher authority walked in, you realized even when I have a disagreement, the right way to go about it is a formal complaint or I'm going to put this in writing or I'm going to do this or that. This whole angry business, that's not going to work kids fighting with each other in a classroom before the teacher walks in, right? They're about to punch each other's faces out. And the teacher walks in and they both become model citizens and sit down. Why? Because the higher authorities walked in and they know even if they have a disagreement, they have a protocol, they have a set of expectations. If someone does something wrong to you, here's what you're supposed to do. That's not what they're doing, right? They, they're taking justice in their own hands. They're doing it their own way. And they know that it's wrong. Even the one that's been done wrong knows that it's wrong. So even they settle back because the victim might turn into the criminal if they don't follow that protocol. Bear that in mind and realize every time you and I have a conflict, when you say, when you remember Allahu Rabbuna wa Rabbukum, that Allah is actually watching the way in which I speak out for my rights, the way in which I make an argument. He's watching it. And he's watching you too. So if you and I are having a disagreement and Allah is watching both of us, even if you don't want to be mindful of that and you want to say the most horrendous things and do the most horrendous things, I can't. I can't respond to your ignorance 
with my own ignorance because everybody says, oh yeah, you want to act stupid? I could show you more stupid than that. You don't know who I am. You don't know who you're dealing with, right? Don't step up to me. I will put you in your place. So we have this notion that we can act in any way we can to get our justice. We have a code to which we have to abide. We have to restrain ourselves. We have to hold ourselves back. And that's Allahu Rabbuna wa Rabbukum. Then comes this powerful phrase. I love this, this teaching. Lana a'maluna wa lakum a'malukum. After saying Allahu Rabbuna wa Rabbukum, we say, the Prophet is commanded to say, we have our deeds. That's what I titled this khutbah today. We have our deeds. You have your deeds. Now let me tell you what somebody might, they hear this. We have our deeds. You have your deeds. <coughs> means I'm going to mind my own business, you mind your own business, right? That's Somebody might hear that and say, that's what this means. But we already know that's not what it means. How do we know that? Because already in the ayah before, in the same ayah, Allah said, I have been commanded to do justice between you. Why would somebody speak out about what's fair and what's not fair if they're going to mind their own business? If you're going to mind your own business, then you never speak about justice. You just say they have their deeds, I have my deeds. To each his own. Right? So what did Allah do with this phrase? He put it in an ayah where you cannot misuse it. If the ayah was just lana a'maluna wa lakum a'malukum. Right? We have our deeds, you have your deeds. You do whatever you want, I'm going to do whatever I want. You do, you, you know, you have your way of doing things, I'll have my way of doing things. Let's not, you know, uh, we can't hold each other accountable. That's not the case. So then if that's not the case, I wanted to alleviate from your minds and mind what the ayah does not mean. So let's focus now on what it does mean. What is, what is this part of the ayah telling us? We have our deeds, you have your deeds. It means several things and a few of them will become part of this khutbah today. You probably have heard or come across different kinds of conversations about deen, about anything else, where there is a kind of comparison where there's kind of comparison. So let me let me give you a ex simple example of that. If somebody says, hey, you give somebody advice, hey, um, you're not praying. You're not getting up for Fajr anymore. I noticed father says to son, you're not waking up for Fajr. At least I pray the others. You know, there's people who don't pray at all. I'm better than them, right? So it's, what did you just do? You're missing a prayer, but the way you wanted to deal with that is, you wanted to compare it to someone else who does much less than you, right? <clears throat> Somebody goes in, you know, gets caught stealing, and then so well, at least I didn't commit murder. <clears throat> I mean, it's haram, but there's bigger harams out there, right? And this comparison thing, it, it, it really helps somebody justify that they're not that bad, right? So you're, you're holding an event, you're holding a, a wedding in the, fa in the family, and the, the, fam the, the event has some haram components to it. And you say, yeah, hey, we had a little bit of fun. We call it, we want to use good words for bad things, right? So it's haram activities, but we want to call it a little bit of fun. That makes, it lessens the blow, right? So you use beautiful words for ugly things. This is what shaitan teaches us, right? Zayyina lahumu shaitan a'malahum. Shaitan beautified their deeds for them. So we're just having a little bit of fun. We'll call it a family get together. Let's not describe the fact that there's alcohol being drunk and shamelessness and all this other stuff. Let's not describe that. Let's just say the family, it's, let's call it a family get together. Right, yeah, okay, so yeah, it's a little bit haram. Yeah, you could say that. But you know, there are some other families. You gotta see that's really haram. That's cap, haram with a capital H. That's, that's a bigger font size haram. That takes over the whole page. So ours is bad, but it's not, God, no, seriously. You, you ain't seen bad. Let me show you bad. Right? When you compare to them, then you'll realize we're actually angels. Compared to them. So what I'm giving you now is there's a mentality that seeps into the mind of people. You and me, common people. What, what's that mentality? Well, I'm, what I'm doing is messed up, but there's way more messed up out there. Let me, let me Google it. I can show you there's much worse people out there. There's people that are doing way worse than I am. What does that do? What, what is the reason for which this is done? One of the reasons for which this is done, very commonly, is that this way you get to feel good about yourself because you get to compare yourself to someone who's doing a lot worse than you are, right? And so Allah must be really angry. Then you have this calculus in your head. Allah must be really angry with them because they're doing so much more messed up stuff, which means the degree of Allah's anger with me by comparison has to be a lot less. So Allah is upset, but he's not that upset now, is he? 
So now you, you start diminishing Allah's displeasure and you start diminishing the fact that you are disobeying Allah. On judgment day, let's just fast forward, judgment day. I stand before Allah and hypothetically Allah asks me, why did you do this? I'm not going to say, where is that other guy? Ya Allah, before you ask me, ask him, he did so much more. And when you compare his record to mine, mine's going to feel like you should just give me VIP to Jannah right now. You should just hook me up right now. Compared to him, I might as well be a Sahabi. You know? So this, this thought process is so... Dist Everybody knows that's not how Judgment Day works, is it? Doesn't it? Allah is not going to say, open up your deeds and let's do a side-by-side -side comparison with the next person and then decide. That's not, that's not how Judgment Day works. But what does shaitan feed you? Shaitan feeds you comparison in this life. Oh yeah, we're doing that. But so what? They're doing so much worse. They're doing so much worse. They're doing so much worse. Right? Never want to compare yourself to someone better. So you always want to compare yourself to someone worse. Now let's take the flip side. That's also another misguidance. So what happens on the flip side? Shaitan comes to you and me and says, Oh, you think you're praying? Oh, just because you pray five times? Do you think this counts? You know, there are people who pray, they pray so long, they pray dhuhr so long, it's almost asr time. And you hit and run. You're just, you know, your salah is like 10 seconds. You think this counts for anything? Oh, just because you fasted in Ramadan, you think you're a good person? The people who recited, they, people recite Quran, in, you know, every three days they finish the entire Quran, and you, you don't even know how to read Fatiha properly. You think this, your, your recitation counts for something? Again, your good deeds are worthless because there are some people who do much better deeds than you. Right? Another kind of comparison, isn't it? And what does that do? That, what that does is, well, my good deeds, I mean, what are they for? I mean, I'm not, I'm no Sahabi, I'm no Sheikh, I'm no Hafiz, I don't know this, I don't know that, I'm not that good, I'm so messed up, so my good deeds become worthless. So what does Shaitan do? On the one hand, your bad deeds aren't that bad. And you know what? Your good deeds, they're not that good. Right? Compared to others. They're not that good. So you basically, he demotivates you from the good. And he doesn't discourage, he, he um, removes discouragement from the bad. And the simple solution to that, that is declared in the ayah, is lana a'maluna wa lakum a'malukum. We have our deeds. The only thing I will ask, answer to Allah for is what? What I did. What I did. Look, two people are arguing. You know why I said that? You know what they said? Do you know what they did? That's why. The, no, 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 no. They have their deeds. They have their deeds. I have my deeds. They disobeyed Allah in their own way. That's on them. But when I have to respond, I have to see if my response is disobedience to Allah or not. Whether it made me feel better, whether they, I think they deserved it or not. That's all secondary. The only thing that matters now is, did I cross the line with my Rabb? Without thinking about anybody else. Without thinking about any, just myself. It's just me and Allah alone. Did I do right? Did I do right? You know, it's like, you know, if, you, if you've been consuming um, toxic food, then you have to detox, right? You have to eat healthy food. And sometimes you have bad junk food cravings. And you, your body says, go just drink that soda or go drink, the, you know, eat that junk food. Just pick up that chocolate again, do whatever, you know. And there's this like unease inside you. So eating, one of my friends, really funny guy, he eats unhealthy all the time, right? And he I was just visiting him and he said the funniest thing. He said to me, I, I was telling him, his wife was telling him, you should eat healthier. And he said, he said, uh, yeah, I'd rather not eat grass and die, die healthy. I'd rather eat what I eat and die happy. <laughs> So in his mind, eating healthy is just the recipe for unhappiness, right? What I'm getting at is if you have been consuming unhealthy, then switching over to healthy is a very difficult transition. Right? It's a difficult change. Why am I bringing this up now? Because if you and I have been so accustomed to comparison, so accustomed to never even thinking about our actions in isolation from others, just what am I responsible for? Doesn't matter what somebody else says or thinks and what, they, what else they're doing. I don't think of my deeds in reaction to somebody else's deeds. I think of my deeds as some things I have to own and I am answerable for them to Allah, not to anybody else. 
when I, I can't, it's hard to think like that. If you've been thinking in comparison your whole life, it takes a detox. It takes a while to get out of that system. And that's why not only did the messenger get told, لَنَا أَعْمَالُنَا وَلَكُمْ أَعْمَالُكُمْ He was told, لَا حُجَّةَ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ There is no case to be made between you and us. In other words, we can argue endlessly. There are people that want to hide in comparison. They can make arguments all the time, all the time. There's no winning an argument. There's no end to it. There's, because if somebody wants to justify their behavior one way or the other, then they can come up with one scenario, another scenario, and you can answer each of them, but the hujja will never come to an end. And then some people's point becomes, their whole purpose becomes proving somebody else wrong. If I can just prove them wrong, I'm, you know, I've accomplished something. You don't have to prove anybody wrong. You just have to declare the truth. This is the justice that I've been given. I'm responsible for what I do. And you know what? My job isn't to prove you wrong. We don't have to keep debating endlessly. لا حجة بيننا وبينكم. So even though we're concerned about wrongdoing and we speak out about injustice, we don't convert that into the need to endlessly debate with those we know there's no point in debating. You make your point known, you make your reasons known, and then you don't live a life of just constant argumentation. You don't do that. لا حجة بيننا وبينكم. There's no room for a حجة. حجة means an argument that is made that you can't make a counter argument after that. You know, like the final blow. There's no reason for us to struggle to finally pin the other one down with, a, with an argument, with a counter attack. لا حجة بيننا وبينكم لنا أعمالنا ولكم أعمالكم لا حجة بيننا وبين وبينكم الله يجمع بيننا وإليه المصير الله will unify Allah will cause a union between us eventually if we don't come on the same page here if we don't figure out some way of I recognize my wrong or you recognize your wrong and we become more unified in this life whether we like it or not one day we're all going to be gathered and unified anyway. We're all going to be physically gathered on Judgment Day anyway. And to Him alone we have to return. And in fact, at the end of it, Allahu Yajma'u Bainana is also, it's kind of, some people look at this as insha'i, and they said, this is maybe a prayer that, that the Prophet is making a prayer that those that are so adamant in arguing, you find people like that, you say, I'll never be on the same page with them. There's no way they'll ever agree with me. They're always going to be antagonistic. They're always going to be a contrarian. Those kinds of people, maybe there's this prayer is enough. From your end, Allahu yajma'u baynana, which can be translated, may Allah be the one to cause union between us. Because humanly it doesn't seem possible. So that can only be by divine intervention. And in the end, we have to go back to him anyway. So that's the that's the mentality that one has to internalize. And this this mindset, I tell you, if we adopted this mindset as an individual, and we adopted this mindset as a community, as a collective, the way we operate in our lives would completely change. It would completely change. I mean, this is a short khutbah about the end of Ayah 15 of Surah Al-Shura. But what it has inside it is life transforming stuff. The decisions, the choices you make in life and I make in life. The things I say, the way we react to people. The way we react to situations. The course of actions that we take. All of this gets completely rewired. Because we're not living in comparison. And we're not living being answerable to our own own satisfaction or our own need, but actually Allah first and then whatever else we were going to do, right? We recalibrate ourselves. So I pray that Allah gives us all the strength of will to detoxify our mindset and to, to, to rebuild the way we're supposed to restructure our personalities in a way that's pleasing to Allah and He alleviates us from the kinds of emotional messes, spiritual messes, social messes, economic messes that come as a result of not following this purified guidance. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim.